He teaches us things we didn't know. Welcome back to One Step Beyond with me, Fia Charles, and my special guest, Professor Dr. Christopher Busby. Okay, um, I think we need to move on in the last section and talk about Fukushima. Now, I know you've written a book here. This is, uh, this is the cover, Fukushima and Health, What to Expect. It is available, isn't it? Yes, yes, of course. And, and this is the uh, proceedings of the third international conference of the European Committee on Radiation Risk, Lesbos, Greece, May 5th and 6th, 2009. So, okay, um, I read a lot of different stuff about what's happening in um, Japan after Fukushima. Uh, you've been there, you've measured stuff. I know you're getting people to send you air filters from cars yes. from all over Japan, which you're analyzed on your mass spectrometer. Uh, gamma spectrometer. Gamma spectrometer, yeah. I beg your pardon. What's happening? Well, the, um, the first thing that's happening is that the, is that the uh, IAEA and the Japanese authorities have been lying... That's the International Atomic the International Energy Atomic Authority. Energy Association, uh, have, have been not telling the truth about the severity right from the beginning. And, and, and to extract the truth from them has been like dragging teeth. Um, I was one of the first people to say that this was a really serious accident. And I said this on the BBC and on ITV right at the beginning and later on did various uh, programs where I analysed what was happening. But all along the line, just like with Chernobyl, what we found was that people were saying that there was no problem when actually there was a problem. And, th and this, in my view, is, is criminal negligence because people could have got out who didn't get out. People could have run away from this radiation. Now, when I went there, I measured ser serious levels of contamination as far south as southern Tokyo. And uh, I went to... And that's how many miles from Fukushima? That's about... Th uh, 350 kilometers south, that sort of thing. And I went to within uh, 100 kilometers uh, um, of, of, the, uh, of the site, and I found quite high levels of radiocesium there as well. And slowly people have been measuring it, and, we, and, and the picture that's emerged is that the contamination there, in the sense of health, is much more serious than, than Chernobyl. And the reason for that is because the populations are very much bigger. The population of Tokyo is about 35 million people. Population out of the, the 200 kilometer radius from Fukushima is about 10 million people. This is an awful lot of people being contaminated with these substances. An awful lot. Many, many more people than, than from Chernobyl. Describe what happened in Fukushima. Well, what happened, as far as we know, is that, uh, that there, and, and of course we don't know the truth, they, were, that, that they haven't even been able to, to figure out the truth because they can't get in close enough because the radiation is so great and a lot of this stuff is melted. And there are four, there are four there are reactors. Four, yeah, there are four reactors, okay. And, and there, there have been meltdowns in, and now in all of them, in all of those reactors. And not only were there meltdowns in the, in the reactor pressure vessels, but each of these reactors had large tanks on top of the reactor containing the spent fuel because they've got nowhere to put the fuel now. So they store it on top of the reactor. So when the reactors explode, whether it's a hydrogen explosion or a nuclear explosion, the explosion causes these, these, these very radioactive fuel rods to fly up in the air and go all over the place. It's, uh, it's uh, unbelievable, unbelievable. And we think it's a nuclear explosion in at least one of those reactors anyway. And, they, and they, the fuel they were using in these reactors was a very dirty fuel called MOX. Mixed well, in oxide. one of the reactors, in, my, in, the, in Just the one of them. number three, yeah. They were using me, uh, mixed oxide fuel which contains plutonium. And this, this is probably why there was a nuclear explosion in, in the waste fuel tank of that particular reactor. Because of the plutonium? Yeah, and that's the one that where you see, if, if you look at the YouTube videos of it happening, you see that one, there's an enormous explosion which goes right up out of the frame of the picture, yeah. and, and uh, that's certainly not a hydrogen explosion. And it would be easy to tell by analysing the uh, xenon isotopes, which is what we did after Chernobyl. In St. Petersburg, uh, the, some Russian colleagues of mine measured the xenon isotopes and was able to show that that was actually a, a, a prompt criticality. It was a nuclear explosion, not a hydrogen explosion. So Chernobyl, Chernobyl was a yes, nuclear explosion? Yes, it was definitely a nuclear explosion because they've measured the ratio of the xenon isotopes. And has that been admitted by the Ukrainians? No, no. Nobody admits anything in this game. There's just a massive cover-up all over the place all the time. It's quite serious. Mm -hmm. And it's not just Ukraine that's... No, 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 it's not, even, it's not even Baltic Ukraine. States, it's actually, Belarus. Well, it's gone everywhere. I mean, in fact, I, we know that it went, it's gone to Sweden. Interestingly enough, there was a paper written by uh, a colleague uh, called Martin Tondell, a young man, who, did, who, who studied the contamination of northern Sweden and showed that there was an 11% increase in cancer in northern Sweden 
for the, for the 100 kilo becquerels of exposure. And so we can use that. In fact, we used that in, in a paper that That's I wrote good. recently yeah, to, to predict the, 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 the cancer yield uh, in the 200 kilometer area. I predicted uh, that there would be 200,000 extra cancers in that area. In, in, the, uh, in, the one, in the 200 kilometer area for, uh, outside Fukushima using this data. So, so what would your message be to the people of that island of Japan? I've told, I've told them again and again and again, there are two things they must do, and they, these are real things, these things they should do. But first of all, they should get out. Absolutely they should get out, they should run. They should leave run. that island. Yes. And I said, right, well, well I don't know about the island. They should certainly get further away than, than sa the south of Tokyo. And if I were living in Tokyo and I was there in Tokyo, I would get out. And I tell them, hundreds of people email me and say, what shall I do, Dr. Busby? And I say, get out. But if you can't get out, because it's not so easy, and one of them said to me, well, we can't get passports, we can't, you know. They can't get passports. Well, they can't, they, they can go to other countries, but they can only stay there for a certain length of time. You know, it's, it's this immigration business. You know, people, so they said that it's very difficult to get out of Japan and to find somewhere to go to. Do you think that the Japanese government is, is making it difficult deliberately? I think they are. I think the Japanese government are freaking out, frankly. And they, and, uh, anyway, so that's the first thing they should do, is get out. The second thing they should do is they can actually take uh, uh, calcium supplements. Now the calcium supplements are just ordinary calcium tablets, they can buy them in the health food shops, and these tablets will help to block the access of the strontium and the uranium to the DNA. This is, this is, this is such a simple thing that they can do. I thought and it was iodine. Cost... No, no, yeah, iodine, surely. They can t but the, the, but the, the, the half-life of iodine is very rapid, eight days, you know, so the iodines have all gone. And so they've either affected the thyroid or they haven't affected the thyroid. There's nothing you can do about that. The government should have handed out tablets. It turns out they didn't. That's what everybody says. But what they can do is with the long-lived isotopes, these the uraniums and the strontium, is they can reduce the access to the DNA by taking calcium, calcium. tablets. Yeah. Just calcium? Just what, what calcium. Else? Can they not just drink milk? No, because the milk's going to have the strontium and the uranium in it, of course. That's the point. And presumably the calcium tablets don't? No, that's right. Made abroad, or yeah, all of those things. So, is calcium easy to assimilate? Yes, yes, it's ha ha totally harmless. People take the calcium tablets for osteoporosis. They sell them in the in the health food shops. So they have no side effects, whatever. And you don't want to take too many. Just so take a, take take one calcium tablet a day. What happens if you take too many? Them. Then you get. Nothing happens. Some other... No, that, no really, that you can't overdose on calcium. It's not possible. Okay, so, okay, let's say that somebody's watching this program who's, who's on a business trip to Japan. Yes. You would say to them that they should go to the chemist, buy some calcium tablets. No, no, I should say to them that they shouldn't go on the business trip to Japan. That's what I'd first of all say. Secondly, if they do go there, they should try to eat food which is sourced from somewhere else, uh, you know, that they know where it comes from. Well, that's going to be pretty hard to do, isn't it? Well, that's what I tried to do, I have to say, when I was there. You know? And also, what I did, I, mean, I can tell you, I took this very seriously. A lot of people that I know who visited Chernobyl after Chernobyl are now dead. A lot of people who went out to Iraq with cameras to, to, to look at the battlefields and to talk about uranium effects and all the rest of it are now dead. This is, this is, like not, this is not a joke. This is very serious business. I, I burned my clothes, so I went out there, I took one set of clothes and I, and, and I took another set of clothes in a plastic bag and when I came back I burned my clothes and put the other set of clothes on. Because these nanoparticles, they get everywhere. And then you've got nanoparticles on you and your children, you know, and you go Did, like you, wear, did you wear a mask? Uh, no, I didn't wear a mask, but a mask is hopeless for these things. It, it, even those things that the Japanese wear, they just try to go right through those things. So you take your life in your hands, and I did take my life in my hands, but I didn't go that close. But you've got a Geiger counter. Oh, yeah, sure. I so did. have you tested yourself subsequently? You can't, you can't measure these nanoparticles, that, because the, ra the, the amount of radioactivity involved in the particles is too small. All you can do is measure, if there's a hell of a lot of them there, you'll get a, me you'll get a signal. But just the sort of little stuff floating about in the air, it's, it's invisible death. Keep away from it. So you, you, what you're saying is that you've got to... Uh You've got to take calcium if you if you have to go somewhere. If you have to, or if something happens, say here. Yeah, then I would take calcium, sure. Absolutely. Calcium. So, so you would recommend people buy calcium and store it because it's presumably it lasts indefinitely. It lasts forever, sure. Of course it does. Yeah, and it's cheap. It's cheap as dirt. You know. So well, you could go to. You could go to chemist. You could go, well, no, you don't do. It. You go to the health food shops. You go to these people like Holland and Barrett, and they'll give you a huge, huge bottle of calcium tablets. Calcium and magnesium they are, because the magnesium helps the assimilation of the calcium. So you get calcium and magnesium tablets, but sometimes they come with vitamin 
D. So you don't want the ones with vitamin D, especially for children. Children shouldn't have vitamin D, so you get the ones without it's vitamin D. It's not only made from sunlight anyway. Vitamin D, yeah, sure, but if you have too much vitamin D that you take, it can affect your bones if you're growing, that's the problem. Okay. Yeah. And, and how effective is, is the calcium then? Well, studies, studies were done in, in, uh, in the 60s, funnily enough, because of, uh, of, well, not funnily enough, because of all the strontium that was coming down in the 60s from the weapons fallout, yeah. at least five or six scientific papers were done where they fed calcium tablets to human beings or rats, and then they, gave, they exposed them to strontium, or they were exposed to strontium, and they measured the strontium in the bone or in the urine and so on, and they found that they worked. They pushed the strontium out. They work. So it's never too late to take the strontium out. The ta calcium tablets. No, it's it's not sorry, big no, so the calcium no, it's tablets. And in fact, in my opinion, you should take cesium tablets. But the trouble is, the government won't license anybody to make cesium tablets. Although cesium is actually quite harmless, you know, so you could easily make these. But uh, there are all sorts of peculiar regulations in, in these areas of manufacturing tablets and so on. So you know, you get, you're in a rather, rather odd area because because it's this sort of quasi. Uh, medical, you see, and once you're in the medical area, there are all sorts of funny rules and regulations. What about the risk to troops that have been in these places where the bombs have gone off? And well, you've got two sets of troops, really. You've got the troops from, from the test veterans, which I've talked about, but the, but the Gulf War veterans suffer from a disease called Gulf War Syndrome, yeah. and this emerged in the 90s, and that's almost certainly a result of exposure to uranium. Uranium gets up, it goes up the nose, it gets through the olfactory bulb into the brain, and goes into the brainstem and it destroys cells. And, and we've done, not we've done, but a chap called Cheney in America has done nuclear magnetic resonance measurements of brainstem cells uh, viability, whether they're alive or not, in Gulf War veterans and compared them with controls and shown that the brainstem is damaged. And that's why they have this Gulf War syndrome. And so it's we, nothing to do with the vaccinations they were given, because one of no, the theories is no, 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 they were given these powerful vaccination right. cocktails. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, it's, it's, it's well, well, to be honest, nobody knows exactly. But, but the evidence is that it is the uranium. Because, because, and the French have done work on, on rats and, and caused, uh, given rats, uh, in, in, uh, allowed rats to inhale uranium and shown that they have sort of problems with their psychology and their sleep, that the sleep patterns are affected and all sorts of uh, uh, brainstem type housekeeping pro pro properties that, 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 that the uranium affects. And also in the Gulf War veterans we found high levels of congenital malformation in their children and that's the other thing that it does of course is it does the chromosomes and because of the chromosomes you get damage to the sperm and then so they get they get children with deformities just like they do in Iraq but here is here we're talking about America the American troops so what about the English troops were being well presumably but nobody studied the English troops but presumably the same sure. so if if somebody's watching who was in the armed services uh, in one of these countries where depleted uranium weapons were used yeah. or possibly live uranium weapons were used should they not have children in your opinion no, I think I think you can have children, but you need to. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's stochastic. You say it's like it's, it's under the play of chance. It just means that if you did an epidemiological study, you'd find there was a higher probability. You know, so you wouldn't say don't have children. But what you would say is if you do have children and they turned out to have something wrong with them, the cause is almost certainly going to be your exposure to these uranium weapons. That's the point. And but the other point that you made is that this goes down the generation. Yes, it does. That's right. That's right. So that's there what, is that, no coming back. From that's what we find with the test veterans. Yeah. Well, well, the, 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 it seems that the one way that this sort of genetic damage gets out of a population is if you die before issue. That's how it goes. Without having children. That's right. That's right. That's the only way of getting these sorts of genetic damage components out of out of people. So we're we're we're, we're increasing the general genetic damage component of the human race, and of course all other animals as well. And the only way that it's going to go down is if people aren't going to have babies. But I have to tell you, it's getting difficult to have babies nowadays, okay? And all this IVF stuff. I mean, when I was young, you know, it wasn't so difficult to have babies. Just shook, shook some girl's hand and she was pregnant. Now, nowadays, you know, you have to go along to hospitals and get IVF treatment, goodness knows what. Because the sperm rate is being attacked. Well, and the eggs too, and the eggs, you know, it's all, it's all damage. I, my, my colleague, Hagen Scherb, has measured the, the sex ratio of, of huge populations in Europe and America all over the place. And what he's found is that after every one of these injections of radioactivity into the biosphere, there's been a shift in the number of boys born to the number of girls. Chris, on that note, we're going to have to end. I want to learn more.